Shalom, shalom, brothers and sisters in Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Alpha, the Omega, the Beginning, and the Ending, who was, and is, and is to come. He is the Lord, God Almighty, Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. Amen. That's according to Isaiah 9, verse 6, Micah 5, verse 2, Revelations 1, John chapter 1, and Colossians chapter 1. They all speak of Yeshua, Jesus, as God Almighty, as God in the flesh. Amen. I believe the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three, are one, according to John 14 and 1 John 5, verse 7 in the King James Bible. And I believe that God was manifested in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 5.19 He was born of a virgin. Isaiah 7.14 And he lived a perfect and sinless life as the Lamb of God. Isaiah 53 And he gave himself as a sacrifice on the cross about 2,000 years ago and rose from the dead three days later to pay for our sin debt, according to Colossians chapter 2. And God is commanding every man, every woman, everywhere to repent. That means to confess and forsake your sins and believe in Christ and follow his commandments. And you received everlasting life through Christ and forgiveness of sins so that we could inherit the kingdom that is to come with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, with all that said, today I want to talk about how Satan, the serpent in the garden, he has been waging war against God and the promised seed that was spoken about in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3, it says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now we could get into an hour-long discussion about whether or not this is talking about Satan's seed as in the Nephilim, the hybrid giants, or if this is talking about the spiritual seed of Satan, those who are, are led by, you know, demons and, and fallen angels. And, uh, you know, even Jesus, when he was walking the earth, he said to the Pharisees, that uh, they are the seed of the viper. They are, you know, basically the, the children of Satan. And so was he saying that they were literally the children of Satan, as in a Nephilim race? I, I don't believe so. I think it is because their conduct and their action uh, made them in alignment with the character of the serpent. So, you know, the Bible says, whoever does righteousness is of God, but whoever does evil and sin is of the serpent. But with all that said, okay, we know in the book of Genesis, there was a seed that was promised to crush the head of the serpent. And so we, of course, know that this uh, prophecy was given after the serpent beguiled Eve and said you could become like God if you eat the forbidden fruit. Okay, and her and Adam ate and their eyes were opened and they sinned and that brought sin and death into the world and I believe it gave uh, entryway uh, for Satan and his fallen ones to enter into uh, the, the, the life of the children of Adam. Okay, because when we sin, we give the serpent a foothold into our life. And uh, that's also seen where Judas, on the Passover evening, uh, was eating with Christ. And, and Judas wanted to uh, sin against Christ. And 
basically sell him out to the Pharisees uh, for like 30 pieces of silver. And the Bible says Satan entered into him, entered into Judas, okay, the son of perdition. So, okay, when we sin, we give Satan access to our realm, access to our lives, and then the serpent leads us astray. Now, with all that said, I believe that this prophecy of the seed of the woman is speaking of Yeshua Jesus, who was born of a virgin, okay? Christ was not born by a man. Joseph was not the actual father of Christ, but rather it was the Holy Spirit. It was God himself who entered into the womb uh, of the virgin, Mary, and planted his seed. Okay, so Christ is literally uh, the Son of God. Uh, you could, you might say, genetically speaking. And so Satan knew that he had to destroy the seed of Adam. He had to corrupt mankind so that this prophecy would not come to pass. And I, I believe that's why you know, Satan uh, convinced the fallen angels to leave their heavenly habitations and mate with the children of Adam, with the daughters of Adam, according to Genesis chapter 6. Okay, so we know that the fallen angels, okay, according to the book of Jude, according to the book of Peter, it says they left their heavenly habitations, came to the earth, mated with women, and created the giants, the hybrids. Okay, so they left their place in heaven and illegally came to earth and did the unspeakable. And obviously this was talked about in the book of Enoch, which is quoted by Jude in the New Testament. And it's actually almost a word-for-word -word quote of the book of First Enoch. Now, it says that Enoch was a prophet. He was the seventh from Adam. And it's interesting because according to the book of Enoch... It also gave a very detailed prophecy of a son of man who would be born and would be given an everlasting kingdom and would redeem mankind. Okay, so we even have Enoch, the seventh from Adam, also talking about this promised seed who is going to deliver mankind and rule in the end of days. And so obviously the serpent knew that a promised seed would be born upon the earth. And so Satan has been trying to destroy that promised seed. And uh, that's why I wanted to do this in-depth in study on Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. Okay, because I have research that indicates that the enemy tried to kill Abraham as an infant, Moses as an infant, and Jesus as an infant, okay? Because the devil did not want the prophecy to come to pass, and I believe that Satan thought that Abraham could have been the promised seed, Moses could have been the promised seed, and of course, Jesus actually was the promised seed uh, that would deliver uh, all of mankind, whoever believes in him and follows his ways, amen? So I will be reading from my document here. It's a Google document, and I'll, I'll leave a link for this as well. Uh, but uh, YouTube is not allowing me to insert links in my video description. So please check out my uh, BitChute or Rumble channel, which is titled Trumpet for Yahweh. And that's uh, one word, and I'll have the link there. Now, I will also be using the book of Joshua, which is quoted in the Old Testament Bible a few times, and it really expands on the birth of Abraham and the life of Moses and how there's actually uh, indications uh, in the heavens that Abraham was sort of a, a chosen child. There was some sort of sign in the heavens when he was born, according to the book of Joshua, uh, which the wise men of Nimrod actually saw. And there's a whole story behind that. So I'll be talking about that. And also, according to the book of Joshua, it says that 
one of the wise men uh, of Pharaoh in Egypt uh, had so- some sort of uh, insight as to the birth of Moses, who was going to redeem the children of Israel. And so that's why uh, the Pharaoh decided to make the children of Israel kill the seed at that time when Moses was born, because Satan was afraid that if, you know, this deliverer would be born from the seed of Israel, then you know, it would overthrow his kingdoms upon the earth. Now, the Bible says expressly that Satan is the god of this world or the god of this age, according to 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. So, basically, all the kingdoms of man, of Adam, uh, have belonged to Satan in the most part uh, since, you know, the very beginning when Adam sinned. And so, Christ is coming uh, to redeem mankind and to bring in his kingdom upon the earth. Now, the Christians and Israel, yeah, that was God's kingdom, uh, but it's always been that Satan had these other bigger kingdoms fighting against, you know, his, you know, chosen nation of Israel and the true followers of Christ today. Okay, so there's always been this sort of ongoing battle, but eventually we know the prophecy says that Satan will be defeated at the Battle of Armageddon, and Christ will rule all nations uh, after the tribulation period. And the book of Revelation says that the kingdoms of this world will be given to the kingdoms of the saints of the Most High. Okay, so we with Christ will rule all the nations, probably along with the Old Testament saints as well. And that, I believe, is the male child, the son of God, you know, and his body ruling uh, at the end of days, okay? The birth of the male child. Now, just as a little bit of history, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, okay, after the flood of Noah, after God reset the earth, okay, then the children of man began to rebel once again, and Nimrod was their leader. Now in Genesis chapter 11, it says that all the kingdoms of the earth got together, started to build this tower, uh, basically to rebel against God. And uh, so I think Satan again was trying to destroy the seed of mankind, trying to corrupt their morality, make them all go to war with God. And so God, you know, basically destroyed the tower confuse the languages so that they couldn't understand one another. This is all in Genesis 11. And Genesis 11 says that that's when Abraham was born. He was called out of Nimrod's kingdom, which is Ur of the Chaldees, the Babylonians. And this is expanded upon in the book of Joshua, which I want to read a portion of here in a moment. So again, the serpent, Satan, the same one in the garden, the fallen angel Lucifer, wants to destroy the seed, the promised seed, who will inherit the everlasting kingdom. And so before it was Abraham, and then Moses, and then Christ, and now it is the remnant Christians who are the body of Christ, uh, sort of still in its infancy. And so Satan is trying to kill Uh, the body of Christ before the everlasting kingdom is born. And and so that's why the Antichrist is going to rise up and and kill not only, uh, you know, most of the nation of Israel, but also uh, any Christians who are left behind after the rapture, they also will be put to death because Satan wants to kill the promised seed before the kingdom and the prophecy is fulfilled. But Isaiah 66, verses 7 through 8 says, Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man child. You might say that is a male child, a male son. And we know that traditionally it is the male son who inherits sort of the family inheritance and rules over the house. Okay, so that's why Christ and his kingdom will inherit uh, the things of the Father and rule over all the nations. 
Okay, and it goes on to say, Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Okay, so out of the painful tribulation period, out of the period of Jacob's trouble, okay, the birthing period, the everlasting kingdom, the male child will be born. And that male child again is Christ and his kingdom and all of the saints uh, since the time that the earth was formed and that mankind was placed on the earth. So we're talking about a 6,000 year body of, of believers, body of saints being born into this everlasting kingdom at once when Christ returns and at the rapture event, uh, which is a sudden transformation event. And that's talked about in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52 and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17. And it basically says that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and those who are alive and remain shall be caught up to be with the Lord forever. Okay, and then after the tribulation period, that's when Christ returns, and the male child is born upon the earth, the everlasting kingdom. And we see this in Daniel chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. This is talking about the final new world order. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings, that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. This is talking about the Antichrist, the little horn. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. That's three and a half years. So the Antichrist will make war with the saints for three and a half years in Daniel's 70th week, Jacob's trouble, the travail of Zion, a seven-year period of tribulation. And then it says, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. And in Daniel 7, it actually talks about the Son of Man, Christ, coming from heaven and uh, being given this everlasting kingdom upon the earth with his saints. Now, it's not just Enoch and Daniel, okay, but we also have this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7 that tells us that, you know, a son would be born of a virgin that's not a direct quote but that's basically what it means now in Hebrew the word virgin is Alma which is a young woman but that's often known to mean that that young woman is a virgin that's what they would call a young virgin I believe is an Alma and so this Alma would bear, bear a son and it would be this big sign and his name would be called Emmanuel which means God with us. Now in Isaiah chapter 9, it goes on to tell us that a son would be given and his name would be uh, called the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, okay, the, the Counselor, and he would be given an everlasting kingdom upon the throne of David. Okay, so we have this prophecy of this promised seed, this Messiah, who would be born and would inherit this everlasting kingdom upon the earth. And obviously this is a threat uh, because uh, Satan, the serpent, wants the kingdoms of the world for himself. He wants, he actually wants God's kingdom. And so Satan is actually using the kingdoms of this world to try to make war with Christ at his second coming. And that's what the Battle of Armageddon is about. Okay, Satan uses his Antichrist and the kings of the earth to make war with Christ and his saints at the second coming. This is talked about in Revelations 19 to 20, uh, Joel chapter 3, Zechariah 14, and so on and so forth. Now, I wanted to talk about the birth of Abraham, who is first named Abram. 
and how you know the Bible says he doesn't say much about Abram and his birth actually it just says here in Genesis 11 it talks about Nimrod and the Tower of Babel uh, which is the first one world order and then it tells us just a small portion about Abram's childhood and the birthplace as we read here Genesis 11 now these are the generations of Terah Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran and Haran begot Lot and Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees now Chaldees is Babylon Okay, that's Nimrod's Babylon. And Abraham and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, which was later Sarah. And the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ishka. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. Now, I've done a whole study about Sarai having no child <laughs> okay this is a metaphor for israel it is a metaphor for the earth who is to give birth to this everlasting kingdom this this messiah figure in his kingdom so just as sarah was barren and she looked like there was going to be no deliverance no promised seed but at the very end when sarah was very old and there was no there wasn't a lot of hope left okay that's when god uh, brought forth this male child uh, which was isaac just as israel in their la latter years as we see today they're very weak uh, they don't have a lot of strengths they're an older nation and god is about to bring forth this male child out of the womb of israel and christ will return to jerusalem to establish his throne amen and it goes on in verse 31, And Terah took Abraham his son, and Lot the son of Haran's son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, and his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. So there we see that's when God called Abraham out of the city of Babylon where uh, Nimrod was still king. And that's talked about in great depth in the book of Joshua, if you're interested. And there's actually a really interesting story there. And my analysis here is, it appears that in the book of Joshua, which is referenced twice in the Old Testament Bible, it fills in the gaps concerning Abraham and Moses and many other Old Testament topics. This book of Joshua was not included in the canon, although that does not mean it is not authentic. But this, I believe, should be considered in careful examination of biblical scripture. The book of Joshua seems to expand upon the early life of Abraham while he was in Babylon, also known as Ur of the Chaldees, during the reign of Nimrod. Now, if we look at the book of Joshua, it tells us that in chapter 8, that Abraham was born and all the servants of Terah and all the wise men of Nimrod and his conjurers came and ate and drank in the house of Terah. That was Abraham's father. And they rejoiced with him on that night. Now, I'm not going to read all of this. I'll leave a link for this document, or you could just go into uh, this book online and read it. But basically, Terah, the father of Abraham, was one of the you know higher-up generals or, or people in Nimrod's army and he was fellowshipping with the wise men the conjurers and the mystics of Babylon and when Abraham was born that night okay that's when the wise men saw a sign in the stars you know just like when Jesus was born and the wise men saw the sign they thought that okay they have to report this sign to the king Nimrod Otherwise, they were going to be punished later for it. And so they told uh, Nimrod that the sign was a, a symbol that the son of Terah, which was Abraham, uh, was going to rise up and overthrow his kingdom, and out of him would come this everlasting kingdom. And so we see that by the sign in the stars that Abraham, at his birth, was supposed to be part of this promised seed, which would overthrow Satan and his kingdoms. 
and it goes on in, in chapter eight of, of Joshua, and it talks about how Nimrod basically, you know, told Terah, hey, give me your child. I'm going to kill your child. And Terah eventually does it, but he swaps the children. He takes his servant's child, and that child is killed. And then it says that basically Abraham was taken and uh, was brought up in this cave where Noah was living. Okay, so Noah, the same Noah, the, the grandson of Enoch, who went into the ark and survived the flood. Okay, he was still living uh, at the time of the birth of Abraham and the early life of Abraham. And I say here in my analysis, the book of Joshua goes on to tell us about how God was with Abraham in his childhood and that he actually spent time with Noah in a cave before Noah passed away. I did the biblical math on this matter and it seems to be plausible. This means that Abraham could have access or copies of the pre-flood documents such as the book of Enoch and writings from Noah. Yet the point of this study is to show that Abraham was foretold about in the stars and perceived by the wise men of Babel, uh, just like the birth of Jesus and the Bethlehem star and the wise men of his days. And because Abraham was foretold in the stars, the king Nimrod sought to kill the child before Abraham would fulfill his destiny, which was set by the Lord God Almighty. You know, the Bible says some uh, are chosen, many are called, but few are chosen. I believe Abraham uh, was chosen before he was born. Now, moving on to Moses, there's a very similar story. Okay, now, if we read the Old Testament, we would know, in the, I think it's in the book of Genesis, it talks about how... You know, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, was oppressing the children of Israel after, you know, Joseph brought, you know, the 12 sons of, of Jacob into the land of Goshen in Egypt. Okay, but later, after that Pharaoh died, another Pharaoh came in and put Israel in harsh bondage and servitude. And the book of Joshua actually tells us that there is some sort of prophecy or dream that showed that... Moses was about to be born, and that Moses would overthrow his kingdom, Pharaoh's kingdom. And so that's why I believe Pharaoh uh, made the decree for all the Israelites to kill their children. And that's why Moses was sent up the stream in a basket. And in the book of Joshua, chapter 67, verse 18, it talks about Balaam, one of the wise men, of Pharaoh, he says, And Balaam the son of Beor answered the king and said unto him, This means nothing else but a great evil that will spring up against Egypt in the latter days. Now this is talking about a vision or a dream that the Pharaoh had. Okay, so the, the wise man Balaam of Pharaoh said, You know, your dream, it means that you know, this, this great evil will spring up against Egypt in the latter days, for a son will be born to Israel who will destroy all Egypt and its inhabitants and will bring forth the Israelites from Egypt with a mighty hand. And that's obviously what we saw in the book of Exodus. And it says, Now therefore, O king, take counsel upon this matter that you may destroy the hope of the children of Israel and their expectation before this evil arises against Egypt. My analysis here is, it appears that this vision set the foundation for the coming persecution of the Israelites in Egypt, as we see in Exodus chapter 1 and 2. Now, we obviously know that uh, there was a prophecy that was given to Abraham while he was still alive, and it says that his seed would go into captivity, would go into bondage for like 400 years, but then, you know, this deliverer would deliver them uh, out of that oppression, uh, that's sort of paraphrasing, but you could read about that in the book of Genesis. Um, but we know that Moses was not killed. He was, you know, he was saved through this, you might say, an ark, okay, this this basket floating on the river. And we, uh, we all know the story, or most of us know the story, that Moses was then taken by uh, the wife of the Pharaoh, or like the handmaiden of the Pharaoh, and uh, basically raised as a son of Pharaoh. 
And later on, uh, after Moses, you know, uh, accumulated all this great honor and wisdom, uh, that's when he encountered the Most High God through the burning bush, and that's when uh, Moses began to deliver the children of Israel with the plagues, and so on and so forth. And you could read more information about this as well in the book of Joshua, chapter 68. And the book of Joshua, chapter 70, also talks about the life of uh, Moses and how he was raised up uh, to be this great person in Egypt under Pharaoh. Uh, but then eventually uh, God got hold of him <laughs> and he was like Saul, okay, you know, the Pharisee that turned into the 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 apostle of the Gentiles, okay, we see that this great, uh, you know, prince of Egypt, Moses, was in, made the humble deliverer of the seed of Israel. And so there's a lot of interesting information in the book of Joshua, chapter 70, about all of that. And so we, we see there that, okay, just like Abraham, they tried to kill Abraham at his birth. We see, according to the book of Joshua, the Pharaoh had a vision or a dream about, you know, the birth of Moses, basically. And the wise man of Pharaoh said, you must kill all the seed of Israel. And so very similar to the birth of Jesus as well with King Herod. Okay, now we of course know that Jesus, Yeshua, is the Messiah. He is a promised seed, okay? And we know that the promised seed was... Uh, to come through Abraham, and then his son Isaac, and then Isaac's son Jacob. And then I believe later it tells us that through the seed of Judah, uh, that's where the kingdom uh, would appear, and then through David and his son. Now David was the second king of Israel after Saul, and uh, through David and his work for the Lord, uh, it was promised that his throne uh, would receive this everlasting king, which is Yeshua Jesus, who will reign uh, in the millennial kingdom after Daniel's 70th week, after the purification of Israel in the seven years of tribulation that is soon to begin. Now, in Luke chapter 1, it tells us about the visitation of the angel of the Lord uh, to the priest Zacharias during the reign of King Herod in Israel concerning his son, who was to come, who is called John the Baptist. So, John the Baptist was the one who made straight the way for the Lord. He came, you know, just a little bit before Christ. And he's just a little bit older than Christ, but that's because he was supposed to be a witness to prepare the people uh, of Israel at that time to receive the Messiah. We then see the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and told her the good news of the Messiah. See Isaiah 7, 14 and 9, 6 also. And he was to be placed in her womb, the seed of the Lord, and his name was to be called Jesus, or Emmanuel. And then we read about the appearance of the Bethlehem star and the wise men, uh, which reported the sign to King Herod, just like we know, according to the book of Joshua, that happened when Abraham was born. And in Matthew chapter 2, it says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now I think it was said by some people that these wise men were from Persia. I'm not really sure, but it's possible. It goes on to say, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Now, I was just watching a documentary about Herod the king and the birth of Christ, and apparently Herod thought that he was supposed to be this everlasting king 
who would have this everlasting kingdom. And so uh, I heard that I haven't vetted this information, but it was said that Herod, uh, you know, had procreated so many times, he had all these different wives and concubines so that his seed would last forever, <laughs> okay? So King Herod thought that he was this everlasting king. He thought that he was the Messiah, and he was troubled uh, when the wise men came to tell him about the birth of Jesus. Okay, so Satan and his king, Herod, uh, they were troubled when there was a sign above Bethlehem. And verse 4 says, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes and the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Now this is Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people. Now, uh, in Micah 5, it also says that he is from everlasting. Okay, so it is the everlasting king that will be born in Bethlehem. And then it goes on to say in verse 7, Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young children. When ye have found them, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. But we, of course, know Herod actually just wanted to kill the child so that he could have the kingdom for himself. And we, we all know the story, mostly, that the wise men came to Joseph and Mary, gave them the gifts of uh, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those were gifts given to a king, okay? And uh, that's when, you know, all the angels uh, worshipped, you know, the Lord, uh, as we I believe we read about that also in Hebrews chapter 1, when the first begotten is is brought into the world and all the angels of God worshipped him. Okay, now we know that uh, the angels can only worship God. And uh, so that, I believe, is a sign that, you know, Christ is God. And we read in verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, because the wise men didn't tell Herod where the where the child was, he was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So just like we see with Abraham, according to the book of Joshua, you know, King Nimrod tried to kill Abraham as an infant, and later we saw that the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, uh, told you know the, the Israelites to kill their seed so that this promised seed would not be born. And now we see here again Herod, this uh, apostate king of Israel, who is very much in bed with the Romans, okay, he had like coliseums and, and crap in Israel. Okay, he wanted to kill the Messiah. And, and so he ordered all the children, all the infants, two years and younger, to be put to death. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation, and weeping, and a great mourning. Rachel, Raquel, weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. Okay, so Jeremiah the prophet knew that the the children of Rachel would be killed uh, at the birth of the Messiah. And then we know that uh, when Herod was dead, that's when the Lord appeared to Joseph who had to flee to Egypt to avoid being killed, that's when Joseph and Mary came back uh, to Nazareth and became a Nazarene. Now, my analysis here is we see that just as Abraham and Moses, the evil ruler at that time, tried to kill the promised child in order to keep their power and authority and to try to subvert the promises of God and his kingdom to come. We understand that Christ brought in the new covenant, Jeremiah 31.31, and Hebrews 8 to 10, which, have, which will fulfill the promises of an everlasting kingdom. 
yet his kingdom is one that cannot be seen at this time, as it consists of the born-again Christians and the Old Testament saints who have already died, uh, but it will be fully manifested after this age when Christ returns in Revelation 19 and rules all the nations with a rod of iron, according to Psalms 2 and Psalms 110. In the Millennial Kingdom, after the end of Daniel's 70th week, which begins after the fullness of the Gentiles. The Millennial Kingdom can also be referenced as the man-child being birthed to rule the nations, both the body of Christ and the head, which is Christ himself. Now, the final child that I want to talk about today is the male child, the man-child, that is referenced in Revelations 12. Now, in Revelations 12, it talks about a male child being born, and just before the dragon can devour the child, he is caught up to heaven, to the Father's throne. Now, I believe this is a symbolic representation of the body of Christ being caught up in the rapture before the dragon with ten horns, the ten kings, can devour uh, the remnant of Christ in these last days. Okay, so just before the New World Order and Satan uh, kills all of the remnant Christian believers, there's going to be a sudden rapture event and the male child will be delivered, okay, just like Abraham, just like Moses, and just like Jesus. Now I say here we see that Abraham, Moses, and Jesus were all foretold about in dreams or in the stars or in prophecy, and all were sent to deliver God's people, and through them the everlasting kingdom of God would be born on earth. Yet there is also one more child to consider in these last days, and it is the body of Christ, the male child, the man-child. The male child is known as the Lord Yeshua Jesus, God Almighty, according to Psalms 2. Yet we see that the man-child, who has a rod of iron, will also consist of the body of Christ, who is given the rod of iron with Christ to reign and rule the nations, as revealed in Revelations 2. Likewise, we see in Revelations 12, which is a lengthy study in itself, that the man-child is born before the ten-horned dragon can devour him. We know from Revelation 17 and 13 uh, that the ten horns of the beast are ten kings of the earth, which will give their power to the Antichrist for one hour, uh, so to speak. So that means that the ten global kings will give their kingdoms to the Antichrist, okay? And then that kingdom will persecute the male child, and but that male child will be caught up to heaven. Now, those who are not rapture ready will actually be put to death according to Revelations 13 and Revelations 20 verse 4. But when Christ returns, the tribulation saints who are killed by the Antichrist for resisting the mark and the image of the beast and so on, they will be resurrected and added to the kingdom, added to the body of Christ for the 1,000-year kingdom in Jerusalem. Now, just to give you a little bit of insight from Revelation 12, in verse 3 it says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, that's the serpent, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Now, this is talking about a new world order government system. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, the woman represents Israel, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Revelations 12.5 And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore years. Now we know Jesus said that the, the latter days Israel will have to flee into the mountains after the abomination of desolation when the Antichrist invades Jerusalem in Daniel's 70th week. So the woman Israel will have to flee into the wilderness for the final three and a half years, which is 1,203 score days.
they will have to flee into the mountains. And Revelation 12 verse 9 says, And that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceives the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused him before our God, day and night. Now, according to my understanding, the Revelation 12 sign of the woman in heaven probably happened in September 2017 with the constellation of Virgo and the birth of Jupiter, and that's a whole study in it of itself. So if you want to see an in-depth uh, study article that I put together, you could access my website using this link here, trumpetforyahweh.blogspot.com. And it's about Revelations 12 and, and the nation of Israel as a woman who gives birth to the Messiah in his body. You know, uh, Christianity was born out of Israel, but it's also about uh, the, the birth of the male child into heaven before the dragon, Satan, can devour him. Okay, I, I believe, again, talking about the rapture before the New World Order begins to start killing people. Okay, that's what I believe it represents. And so please check that out if you're interested. Um, I think I'm going to end the study there. I pray it was helpful. And again, you could access this document here that I'm reading. I'll leave a link for this at my video on BitChute and Rumble. And again, that is the channel name Trumpet for Yahweh, one word. And uh, anyhow, I hope to see you all in heaven very soon. And Jesus said, let us watch and pray always that we are counted worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man, according to Luke 21, verse 36. And I hope to see you all in heaven very soon. And shalom until next time. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bring you shalom. According to the high priest blessing from Numbers chapter 6. Amen.